climatic changes and increasing temperatures, changing weather patterns are affecting exactly the people that are the most vulnerable already. And the farmer, who are marginalized farmer, very poor, they don't have any government support. They actually depends on uh, uh, you know seasonal agricultural activities. That means they produce something and then they sell that, and the money they get again they invest that money for agriculture activities. So if there is any natural disaster because of the climate change, like uh, heavy rainfall or heat waves, that can actually destroy the whole uh, production systems. That means that farmer they are losing you know their asset. So it is very difficult for them to do agriculture again. Climatic changes, so changing weather patterns, changing environments, it's generating exacerbating factors that already were the factors and reasons that people were leaving. The cascading effect, there is a cause and effect relationship yeah. of climate change for agricultural uh, production, poverty and health and education and everything. So what we're seeing is that more and more people are indeed moving from rural areas when they cannot sustain a living into urban areas. What happens though is that people that have been making a living related to, for instance, agriculture, that are moving into urban areas now, are often faced with a widespread level of insecurities, and partly because they don't have the, the skills in terms of labor to, to work with something else, they don't have the same networks and family connections, and they're just not used to the types of livings that they're faced with in urban areas. They realize that in order to find protection and assistance, they think that it's better to, to move elsewhere. But our uh, agriculture system is energy driven. I mean, energy is coming from like uh, fossil fuels or, or for uh, minerals. Fossil fuel is playing a huge role for carbon emission from agriculture sector too. 30% of carbon emission is coming from agricultural sectors. But uh, I mean, this is just beginning. You know, we are we are just observing the negative impacts of the climate change on agricultural sector and how it is related with poverty. And now the policymakers, you know, the leaders, communities, the people, they are recognizing that yes, it it is making the poverty situation worse. What could be done in these locations in general to improve access to healthcare, access to education, and also to look at how can people get more integrated. And how can you can make it more um, adaptive, resilient, and also ecosystem based. Al margen, comunidades, las de resistencia Es la necesidad de amarse, de desearse Como serpientes que palpitan al ritmo de la rebelión Contra el gigante robótico sistema Emergimos las mamas de donde Uku, pacha, manda, agua, caman, reina, junchi Kai, pacha, pica, sumacta, causa, junchi Ama, manje, chu, ama, pin I was born in Kolkata, which is a big metropolitan city. It's in northeast India, in a state called West Bengal. So as most big cities are, it's polluted, it's very very populated and the place where Kolkata is situated, the temperature is very high almost throughout the year. Most part of the year it is summer, it's like just one and a half to two months of winter where the temperature is just around 17-18 degrees that is the lowest we get and in the summers it shoots up to like 40-45 degrees. So when I was growing up during these summer seasons, these months of intense heat, I would experience acute loss of energy, disinterest in studies, coursework, going to school or college. I felt like I shouldn't do anything, just be at home and nap. There was this time 
when for a week i remember i didn't go to college i bunked all the lectures it was the end of that week and i was looking back to what i have done the entire week there was nothing on my list all i did was switch on the ac and nap or watch movies i didn't step out of the house i didn't go to college study I lost attendance and I I wasn't even meeting any friends so I was like very lonely and depressed and also anxious because I wasn't doing anything so that is when anxiety kicked in anxiety attacks are very very suffocating you know you feel like something is going wrong but you don't exactly know what is there's not a very clear stream of thoughts you're not able to grasp on the situation or understand what's going on but you know definitely that there's something wrong and you feel dizzy you feel breathless you feel suffocated it's it's not a very good feeling it's not desirable so when i calmed down a bit after that anxiety attack i realized that enough is enough and i should get my life back on track so i decided that next morning i would wake up and head to college but when i woke up and i looked out of the window the sun was so strong it was so hot and humid outside that i gave up i i knew that i couldn't bear it i cannot go to college and work it would make me very very sick and exhausted so what i'm trying to say here is it's a vicious circle i wake wake up i see that it's hot i do not go to college i realize that it's wrong and that is when the anxiety kicks in and then i decide no i'll do the opposite of it i'll go to college but when i wake up the next morning i again look out of the window it's equally hot and i, de- I and i decide that it's impossible i cannot step out of the house it's so so hot so this is what goes on and sadly enough it happens with a lot of people around It's even sadder that the young people out there they're not being able to realize that it's the climate that's doing this to us. Most kids out there who are not attending school and college at the end of the day they are blaming themselves but they don't know that it's not them it's the climate that is doing it. I have another case study of my friend on this line. I'm Trisha I'm a student here at Mahi in Mumbai we used to live in an apartment. I didn't know what to do. I wasn't working at all. I was always lagging behind in my studies over there. When I moved to Manipal, things changed for better. The rainy seasons here are so beautiful. I mean, it rains very heavily in Manipal. It did so in Mumbai too. I was over there during the 2005-2006 floods, which was a nightmare. I mean, I and living over there it used to be so stressful i mean the climate was ah it was awful that's not the case in manipal it's a very quiet place and uh there are not many people over here there are only a few people here and even though it rains very heavily in manipal too uh since it's situated on a hill all the water kind of flows down to udpi and it it was way better than in mumbai over here i mean there are so many trees and everything and and what do i say i just love living in manipal so my opinion on this matter is that there are so many measures and policies being taken up to help people face climate change but it mainly focuses on the physical health issues and it doesn't really give a lot of importance to the mental health so what i want to say is mental health is of equal importance and as trivial as it may sound that laziness and lack of energy is coming from heat humidity and, and climate change it is not the american psychological society has to say that mass extinction of species natural disasters are bringing in depression and anxiety to the youth something that is related to our daily life that is making us anxious making us deal with anxiety so i think it is time that we come out and ensure ourselves that it is not us who are lacking energy or enthusiasm it is the climate that is making us feel this way it is very serious it is very very true and it's heartbreaking This is the Subachoque River, a natural wonder which is located in the province of Cundinamarca, Colombia. It flows through the municipalities of El Rosal and Madrid, 
before joining the Bojacá River in Mosquera and which flows into the Bogotá River. This river caters to these municipalities of the savanna of Bogotá. But as it travels through the municipalities, we see how the hand of man is involved and not in a positive way. El río Subachoque tiene unas características especiales de contaminación eh, que son propias del de, de río y propias del de territorio donde nace. Eh, en la zona donde nace el río Subachoque hay eh, explotación agrícola y explotación ganadera. Eso hace que, por un lado, haya deforestación de sus, de sus laderas eh, en los cultivos eh, que se están dando. Y por otro lado también hay deforestación por la misma razón, para poder eh, extender los potreros. Otra forma de contaminación y es que se viene desecando el río precisamente porque los campesinos y los moradores de sus riberas han venido canalizando el río y sacando aguas. Y eso hace que, que, que por la misma manera poco planificada e indiscriminada como se ha ido sacando el agua, el río se viene secando y contaminando. Garbage, polluting chemicals, flower companies that extract large amounts of water for irrigation and agriculture leave the river flow completely dry. But even more, we see the forestation around it to the point of leaving it almost completely dry. In recent years, an alert has been issued as the river flow has decreased in a serious way. This problem also affects its inhabitants since the contamination allows breeding of mosquitoes carrying dengue, a serious disease. Another consequence is water rationing since there is not enough for all populations. I'm showing up at special events that the United Nations hosts um, because it's important to remember that the young people are not only inheriting the problems that yeah. exist today, the older generation leaves those jobs. They're going to take over. And that's when we're going to see real change, I think, but maybe not before then. My relationship with the ocean started at a young age. I was very lucky to have grown up spending more time than most Canadians around the ocean. It was those experiences that inspired me to become a scuba diver in 2016. Well now really, when we go back then to falling in love and say it's crazy, falling, you see? We don't say rising into love. There is in it the idea of the fall. And uh, it is, goes back, as a matter of fact, to extremely fundamental things. That there is always a curious tie at some point between the fall and the creation. Taking this ghastly risk uh, is the condition of there being life. Throughout the years, the childhood wonders that I had witnessed were gone. Slowly, more and more of the biodiversity of the ocean was disappearing. More than ever, planetary health is a growing concern. Around the world, we're seeing the impacts of microfiber and chemical pollution on the ocean's ecosystems. From the Southeast Asian and North American reefs, to the European seagrass meadows, and the Northeastern Pacific kelp fields, aquatic biodiversity is in decline. Man-made synthetic fibers are one of the main sources of microplastic waste in the oceans. Fashion is the second most polluting industry after oil. Not only 
do synthetic fibers and chemical dyes affect water quality and acidity, but it also contaminates the food and the habitats of plants and animals living there. As we already know, plastic doesn't biodegrade. Ingesting plastic chemicals such as BPA, phthalate, and other industrial pollutants can bring upon illnesses such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cancer, and create birth defects. In Canada, we're abundant in natural resources. And over the years, we're gonna lose most of those resources. We've noticed it on a small scale and are now just recently starting to realize it on a large scale. My name's Mark Terry. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at the uh, Dottelay Institute for Global Health Research. And I spent a large part of my career as a documentary filmmaker and an explorer in the polar regions, uh, particularly Antarctica and through the Northwest Passage in the Arctic. There's been lots of changes in um, in the Arctic and of course Antarctica, but mainly in the Arctic where we see a lot of the sea ice disappear. You know, almost half of it is gone. The darker water is attracting more heat from the sun as opposed to the, um, the, the white ice which reflected the sun. So the entire Arctic is getting warmer because of that. There's a lot of health issues and also um, the physical problems of things coming up through the permafrost as that melts, we're getting all kinds of seeds and spores entering the atmosphere, introducing new diseases to people in the Arctic that they never suffered from before. We study the impact of the fashion industry on the environment. We encourage brands to find alternatives to synthetics and to move to recycled or natural fibers. We not only educate brands, but educate people on how to shop and source their clothing more responsibly. After creating two sustainable clothing lines myself, I was able to educate people on design and how to do it sustainably. If this can be done on a small scale, think about how well it can do on a large scale. By promoting innovative design with eco-friendly materials and sustainable production, we can improve the health of global citizens, all while improving the health of our planet. A message I have for everyone would be to just get out into nature. Learn, discover, make memories and connections with it because without getting to know the environment, it's difficult to understand why protecting it is so important. To policymakers and change makers of the United Nations, you have the power to change the norms in all industries. Fashion is no different. Creating and enforcing regulations can heavily make an impact on how we treat our environment and how we protect our oceans. So I start with the idea that we cannot conserve something that we don't know. High in the Andean equatorial region, there is a fantastic endemic ecosystem, the Paramu. Here, even with extreme environmental conditions, life blooms. There is full of life in here, a variety of colors, a wide variety of shapes, and a variety of ecological services that maintain planetary health are really important because they provide a lot of services in terms of biogeochemical interactions, biodiversity, carbon sequestration, storage and provision of water, and also other cultural services. So we live in the city, but we completely depend on the Paramo ecosystem. The vegetation captures the fog and the rain moving water from the atmosphere to the earth. The spaces between salt particles, organic matter content and volcanic origin metals make the soil seems like a sponge that stores water and slowly releases it for rivers to flow. Right above this paramo, another ecosystem waits a wild cover wind that has already been impacted by climate change. Where there used to be ice is nothing more than some rocks. The glacier is melting faster than ever before. And each year, its boundaries are gone. 
Back in the Paramos, about climate change impacts, we are not really sure. The changing patterns of precipitation could modify the discharges, affecting the drinking water supply, or even causing floods. With climate change, we will have a variation in precipitation. So, in that sense, the Paramos, what they do is like to store these peaks, these high peaks of precipitation, uh, and they drain this excess of water into the system during dry season. So they are very important uh, to regulate the, this heavy, let's say, uh, increase of flow in the system. Based on the different uh, scientific evidence, we have seen that the, the soil, the parents, because of their property, they sequester a lot of, of different carbon pools. So as long as we don't change the land cover of the paramos, we can consider paramos as sinks of carbon instead of uh, sources. So in, indeed, they have a very important role in climate change, to tackle climate change. The same organic matter that helps with water regulation is considered as a carbon stock. So the carbon is not emitted, but kept it into the soil. As academics, our role is to find scientific answers to those questions that are not well understood. So to create awareness among the people, not only the students, but also the citizens, the stakeholders, to, to really make them understand where the water comes from, what is important and the role of this in a One of the most visited cities in the world and its lagoon are disappearing and the sea level rise is just part of the problem. che tutti, tutti si diano la mano e bisogna essere tutti uniti per, per affrontare questi che sono evidentemente gli effetti dei cambiamenti climatici. Adesso il modo si capisce che serve e bisogna fare questo a favore. To better understand how climate change is impacting Venice, I called few people. This is a free message. The customer you called is not available at the moment. Except for this unfortunate attempt, I did find people willing to discuss problems, but also solutions. One of them, and the one who threw light on the problem for me, was Alessandro Sartori, ornithologist and expert of the lagoon. I slowly started to put the old Venetian situation in focus. What happened last November was not just an exceptional flood, a quarta eccezionale, was the exceptional proof of a failed political, cultural and mental system which puts the interest of individuals and groups before the interest of the entire community. È una situazione molto complessa, per cui bisogna mettere sul tavolo i problemi, togliere quelli che non sono problemi reali, togliere quelli irrisolvibili, togliere quelli che si possono risolvere subito, risolverli subito, si fa una lista più seria di questi problemi. In questa lista di problemi si cominciano a dare delle più priorità. I'm not talking about morphological degradation, tourism, economic growth and exploitation. I'm not an expert. There are experts. The problem is the unheard voice of these people. Se qualcuno è isolato, certamente no, no, fa molto, insomma. C'è un sacco di gente che ha voglia di fare quello che manca in questo momento, secondo me, le persone capaci di fare sintesi e di creare il fatto che questi individui, funzionari, enti, associazioni... It's missing is a network between all these people with solutions and ideas. Personal interest and greed get in the way. The lagoon is disappearing, and soon, life will be impossible.
a land of true beauty. From the blue ocean and the reef, to the rainforest and the valleys. I live in paradise. But paradise doesn't last forever. We're at a time like no other in the history of man. We are faced with our own possible extinction caused by ourselves. We've gone through uh, fires in our rainforest in Yungar, which is just, it's never happened before. We've had mass flood events, um, you know, you walk outside now and you can feel just how muggy and hot just so temperatures are. It's open to eyes up. Um, you, you can't dismiss something like that when a whole community burns down, a whole half the state burns, when you lose your house, you know. And it takes those sort of personal impacts to go, hey look, there's a, there's a bigger picture thing going on. When you've got pretty much every single ex-fire chief telling you months and months in advance that this is what's going to happen and it's being driven by climate change and with global warming, the writing's on the wall. In the summer of 2019, 206 temperature records were broken in just 90 days. 12 million hectares of land has been burned. 25 people and an estimated 48 million animals in New South Wales alone have been killed. The Whitsunday Islands, the gateway to the Great Barrier Reef and home to the iconic Whitehaven Beach. A unique ecosystem which is suffering dramatically from the impact of human-induced global warming. So we get a lot of coral bleaching um, and that is because the water temperature is changing so dramatically over such a short period of time. You're getting a lot more of it over summer when we're getting those uh, dramatic changes and shifting because of the wet season. Turtles starting to lay eggs on Whitehaven Beach which isn't so common because the silica content's not changing temperature like other beaches. If you accept the science, um, accept that the, you know, we're solution based rather than you know, just pointing out the problems that um, you know, we, can, we can have a, a future that's viable, that's long term, that's happy and healthy. This is my message to the United Nations and the Australian Government. Change needs to be implemented now to reduce our carbon emissions and pollution support the health and well-being of our communities and to protect the paradise that I call home before it's too late. Yeah,